We're going to be discussing alliums for the veggie garden, so mainly we're going to be talking about ones that are edible. We're not going to be discussing the ones that are ornamental today. So when we're talking about the alliums that we're going to be discussing today. We're going to mostly be talking about garlic, onion, and I'm going to touch on leeks and shallots. Sometimes they're not the easiest things to grow in Tennessee because we're not really the right, the, the right growing region. But I thought we're going to try to highlight some more of these vegetables and I think a lot of people are going to be growing a garden this year who have never grown a garden this year. So be prepared to have a hard time finding some of these things. <laughs> when we're talking about edible alliums, we're going to be talking about the ones that prefer a cooler season. So most of these things do better whenever it's colder. Once it gets really hot, they don't perform as well. So sometimes they may diminish their growing or they may just slow down their growing completely in the summertime when it gets above 75, 80 degrees. A lot of these things prefer to be grown in, in the last part of February and in the springtime, and then you're harvesting them in the summertime. They prefer well-drained soil. Most of these alliums that we're going to be talking about today are relatively easy to grow, provided they're not going to sit in soggy soils. And if they sit in soggy soils, they can have a tendency to rot. And that's probably the main issue why some of them fail is we have soil that's really compacted with some clay. We have some soil that doesn't have a lot of high organic matter in it. And it and it holds a lot of water. And sometimes we see people planting their vegetable gardens in lower spots in the yard that hold water. And over the past couple of weeks, if you've been outside and you're seeing lower spots in the yard, that's not a great place to put a garden. The ideal situation, if you're gonna find where you're gonna plant your vegetable garden, dig a hole that's a foot wide and a foot deep fill it full of water if that water is still sitting there a day afterwards that's not a good spot to put a vegetable garden the soil has to be well drained and there's other classifications for that but for the most part the soil needs to be well drained and most of the alliums they just need a complete fertilizer at the beginning and that could be a triple 10 or triple 15. it's kind of hard to say here's the specific amount of fertilizer you need to put on your garden because we don't know what's already there and if you've never performed a soil test to see the amount of phosphorus, potassium, pH, calcium, uh, or iron, boron, sulfur, zinc, all those micronutrients, if you've never had a soil test done in your soil, it may be a good time to do that. But a lot of these are, are pretty forgiving on the allium side, but it's hard to just give a specific regimen to say, you should put this much amount on your soil. We just don't really know that. But just use a general complete fertilizer at the beginning Usually, they need some nitrogen four to six weeks after planting only as a side dressing because if we put way too much nitrogen on, we'll say specifically for onions, we're going to get a beautiful tall green plant. And then later this summer when we actually go down to pull it up, it's going to have a bulb that's going to be the size of a quarter. We're going to be focusing on the top growth as opposed to focusing on the bottom growth. The key with all of these alliums, onions, garlics, shallots, and leek, we've got to control the weeds. And we have probably four cool season weeds that are really common right now, and that's the main one right there in that picture, and that's chickweed. It makes a carpet, and it's growing right now. We have henbit, dead, spotted dead nettle, um, and dandelion. They're all kind of cooler season weeds that are popping up right now, and they're growing. If we don't control the weeds, our plants will suffer and that just mainly going through and pulling a lot of these things up will help you out in the long run because they are going to pull energy they're going to pull up that nitrogen they're going to pull up that fertilizer that you put out for your onions and they're going to use it on their growth i like to use in my i grow a lot of garlic so this presentation is geared toward the end more on garlic i use a lot of straw the only problem with straw is the residual wheat seeds that are left behind. Now I do go in the in the winter time and I try to pull up as much wheat as possible. And I did that last week. When the wheat gets larger, it's easy to pull up after a good rain anyways. It's really hard to find straw that's not uh, that's already been harvested. You can buy sometimes straw called virgin straw where they harvested it before it actually uh, developed seeds at the top, but I, I have never seen that before. Uh, for sale before but i've read about it but i've never seen it for sale i use 
a lot of straw to actually help suppress the weeds. You can also use plastic. You can use sometimes the landscape fabric. We've just got to keep the weeds at bay because if we have weeds overtaking these, our plants are going to suffer. So I kind of broke this up into the four plants and leeks and shallots, I did lump them together because they're mostly grown together. Now when we're looking at these, probably the most common one is onions and they're probably the, the most common vegetable grown all throughout the world. We have three main branches of, of onions. You have a short day, an intermediate day, and a long day onions. You also have onions that, that don't form a bulb. And then you have some called bunching onions and they mostly are grown for the greens and the small haft at the bottom. For the most part, Tennessee, we need to be growing the right onion for our region. Sometimes if we're trying to grow some of these other onions that are more inclined to being really up north, or some of these onions that are really used to being down south, they're not going to form a bulb in Tennessee. They'll grow, but they won't form a bulb that's going to be of any substantial size. For Tennessee, we need to find onions, ideally, that are in the class called intermediate day, and that's all based upon day length. So I'm going to give you some recommendations on some in just a few minutes, but you may Google online trying to find different web, websites selling onions, and they'll say, do you, do you want short day, intermediate day, long day? Tennessee, for the most part, it's intermediate day. Now, Tennessee is anywhere from East Tennessee to Memphis is zone six, seven, or eight. We're kind of varied a little bit, so kind of do your research. I would also ask some of your gardening friends who are close, what varieties have you had success with? because uh, we can't really trial every variety because there are hundreds of varieties of onions out there. And it would be good to try to trial some. Now this year I'm growing three different varieties of onions in my garden this year. So uh, I always try a few uh, of the standard ones and I'll show you one of them in just a second. And then I always try one or two random ones just to see if they actually grow in, in Tennessee. But Tennessee gardeners, we need to be focusing on the intermediate type onions. For planting onions, you can get seeds, you can get sets, or you can get plantlets. If you're direct planting onion seeds into the ground, sometimes if we're not maintaining the ground right, they're going to be overtaken with the cool season weeds such as henbit and chickweed. So if you're going to start onion seeds, you should have done that a couple of months ago and then transplant them into the garden. We've, we've, we've seen people directly plant onion seeds in the ground and they work, but you got to stay on top of the weeds. For the most part, when I'm trying to buy onions, it's easiest to buy the sets, which are the small, tiny bulbs, or the plantlets, which come in a bunch anywhere from 50 to 75. So you'll see, uh, if you go to the store, the uh, box store, the co-op, or wherever you're buying your plants at, they should have sets or plantlets, and you can buy onion seeds. But for a matter of ease, and since we're kind of moving a little bit later in the year, sets and plantlets work out fine. Now, sets are the small bulbs and plantlets are the little bunches of onions that you buy. They're, they're just basically already growing plants that you just directly transplant into your garden. Sets and transplants, we could have started planting these in our gardens the last week of February up until about last week. You probably can still plant some right now. They may not get as, as large as a bulb as possible, but if you can still find onions, I would still go ahead and plant onions. I just planted mine two weeks ago, but the ideal planting times for onions from the sets and the plantlets is the last week of February to the last week of March. If we were kind of looking at different varieties, now Tennessee, we don't have a lot of onion production. So these are a lot of recommendations based upon some other websites. And some of them are the ones I've grown before. Like this year I'm growing red candy and candy and superstar. And candy is uh, yellow, superstar is white, red candy is red, Cabernet is red. I can't remember what color Zoe is. But these were kind of the ones that were recommended for Tennessee's gardens because these were intermediate day onions, which are the ones that are recommended for Tennessee. Now, I took this picture a couple of weeks ago. Now, this is what the gardens, my little garden looks like. The plantlets that I prefer, it's just easiest to till my garden, get it really soft, and they're kind of hard basically going through the ground and sticking them in the ground like sticking a pencil in anywhere from an inch and a half to two and a half inches deep. On harvesting the onions, you can harvest them really whenever you want to, because I grew up eating green onions with pinto beans and cornbread. So we used to eat them at the beginning and then we would leave some in the garden to get a little bit larger when they, uh, or actually whenever they get ripe kind of. Harvesting on onions, 
when they're ideally stopping to grow, stop growing in the garden, the tops will fall over and they will become limber. So they basically lay themselves over. We need to kind of rest these things or go through a period of cool curing so people will lift them from the ground and they will leave them on the ground for a couple of days to kind of let them dry out. And then curing is, is basically the principle of hanging them out of the sun somewhere under a porch. Sometimes I hang them like my garlic, I hang it in rafters in a barn, but it needs to be out of the sun. Basically, you're giving them, uh, you're helping with their storability. You're helping them last because you're drying the outer shells of the uh, onion or the garlic or whatever, just so it will last a little bit longer. A lot of onions will not last six or eight months, so sometimes you have to use them up within a few months. That's just on the harvesting the garlic, but you can harvest it any time. Now that's kind of the, the the beginnings of onions. I'm gonna hit on leeks and shallots. They are similar to onions. Now you can buy seeds or plants on leeks and shallots. So if you go to a lot of different reputable websites, and I wanna encourage you, if you're buying plants online, research some of their reviews. There are a lot of plant websites where I see people selling things that I know that are not right. Maybe it's a Photoshop photo of something and I think, and people are buying it. And uh, I have people talk to me about some of these things. Make sure it's a reputable website. And if you have questions, I can give you recommendations on reputable websites kind of at the end. Most of these leeks and shallots prefer cooler temps. In the southern part of the United States, leeks and shallots are planted in the fall because they have a more mild winter and then they're harvested in the next spring or early summer. In Tennessee, we typically need to plant them in early spring and harvest them in the fall. Now we need to grow more of these things to actually see the proper growing because they're not widely grown, even though I, I've seen people have success with them. I think some of these need to be trialed a little bit more in Tennessee so we can see how to properly grow these. So if you are growing leeks and shallots, I would love to know your successes. I would love to know your failures. And I would love to know what varieties, especially you're growing in Tennessee that are doing well. On planting, anywhere from an inch and a half to two and a half inches deep. Now that goes for the same for the little, uh, the onion plantlets that you're buying, about an inch and a half, two and a half inches deep. In rows, 12 to 16 inches, I need to be able to walk down the rows and also they need to be spaced four to six inches across <clears throat> because sometimes they can get a little bit larger and they don't need to actually tower over each other. We need airflow between a lot of these plants because if we have water sitting on leaves, sometimes we can have some mold issues. And if we have bunch of plants bunched up really close together, we can have issues with mold later on down the road. On leeks and shallots, here's some recommended cultivars for Tennessee, Alcazar and Lancelot on the leeks. Now shallots are matador and conserver. Now on leeks, we want that stem, basically where it's under the ground to be white, so sometimes people will put soil around the base of the stem to blanch the stem to keep it out of the sun to keep it white. So you'll hear the term blanching sometimes like cauliflower. People will, used to on older cauliflower, they would take the leaves, tie it up around the top, leave it with a rubber band because they wanted their wild or cauliflower to be as white as snow. Now leeks, we need to kind of keep just, you know, an inch or two every week just to keep it up a little bit to keep that stem white and to keep it out of the sun. On harvesting the leeks and the shallots, shallots when the neck is limber or falling over and anywhere on the maturity is from 100 to 120 days. Leeks, you use them anytime. And it's kind of the same principle with onions. Leek, you're not really growing them for the big bulb at the bottom, you're growing them for the stem and they kind of have a mild onion type flavor. Maturity anywhere from 95 to 110 days. So there are windows of these because onions, there's tons of different cultivars of onions. Now there's not as many cultivars of shallots and leeks, but I think over the next few years, we're seeing a lot of newer cultivars come out because plant breeders are trying to develop things that do better in the home garden with less maintenance. So some of these have a window of 25 days. So some may mature a little bit earlier, some may mature a little bit later. Out of all the allium species, my favorite hands down is garlic. We need to be planting garlic in the fall time, anywhere from late September to early November. 
And like I said earlier, if you've got lower spots in the garden or your yard where you're thinking about putting a garden that, that holds water, we really should not be planting any of these edible alliums in that because they can rot. And I've had areas where I planted garlic in a lower area of the garden. I think it's going to do fine, and it sits in rain. Because Tennessee, we could go six weeks without any substantial amount of rain, and then we'll go eight weeks, and it rains four or five inches a week. And we're seeing some records broken right now for the amount of rain that we're getting. So be prepared to have a, uh, if you've got a lower spot in your yard, for if you had a vegetable garden there, for some of it to possibly rot. On the pH, on pretty much any of these, anywhere from six to six and a half is an optimum range for these. Most soils in Tennessee is optimum and does fine. Now, there are a few plants that are really picky about pH. I can think about azaleas really like a low pH and blueberries like a really low pH, but most vegetables in Tennessee that we're growing, the soil pH should be fine. How to plant, we're gonna be separating these cloves and we're gonna be making sure that we plant them roots down. We don't take one entire bulb and plant that whole bulb into the ground. Each clove is gonna make a new separate plant. Six inches deep, two to three inches, or six inches apart, two to three inches deep. We need to space these cloves out so that they can actually grow. Now, some of these garlic cultivars, they can get anywhere from two to three inches. So some of the newer ones can get quite large, but they have to have room to grow. If they're bunched in there really close together, they're not going to get any size on them. And like I said earlier on, all of these leeks, shallots, onions, garlic, fertilize according to your soil test. Uh, and if you are fertilizing, so fertilizing any of these alliums to begin with, just a good well well-recommended uh, balanced fertilizer, triple 10, triple 15, and don't fertilize on garlic after the last week of April because we're gonna get a lot of top growth and we're not gonna get any bulb growth. So they're gonna start forming the, their bulb anywhere from May to the beginning of June. And you wanna have the plant focus on that as opposed to focus on leafy growth. If we go through with a bunch of nitrogen in May, beautiful tall green plants, but when we pull them up, they're gonna have really small bulbs. This is kind of looking like some of the rows in some of the gardens that I've had in the past. Six inches deep, two to three inches deep. Usually I'll just dig a furrow and then I'll cover it up. And then I usually put straw on top of it. You can see on that picture on the right, I use a lot of straw in my garden. And I like it also because it adds a lot of organic matter back. Anytime you can add organic matter to your garden, I really think it helps out. Whether that's some type of well-composted manure compost, leaf mold, straw, old hay that's been out for a couple of years, anything like that works out well in the garden. Anytime you can turn something back under, I really think it's going to help out. Garlic's going to begin growing right whenever it gets really cold. Just to show you, we, we're going to get some snow and don't panic. Garlic can handle it. So garlic will be able to handle four or five inches of snow on top of it and just peek its little head out and do just fine. Some garlic can get pretty large, and like I said earlier, you need to make sure you're spacing them anywhere from six to eight inches apart so that they can actually get large enough. Now, there are two main branches of garlic that we can grow in Tennessee. We have hard necks and we have soft necks. Everybody has their favorites. Hard neck has a shorter shelf life. Soft neck will last longer. So typically what we buy in the store is a soft neck garlic because it can last anywhere from six to nine months. Hard neck will last less than that, but it can last anywhere from three to six months. So it just depends on how long you want to keep it. But we can grow both. Hard neck tends to prefer cooler zones. So hard necks really need to go up further north. If you're growing garlic in Canada, you really only need to be growing hard neck. It does make a larger clove and it forms a flower. Soft neck does not form a flower, and it prefers to be in, you know, southern Texas, Louisiana, Florida, southern Alabama, but we can grow both of them here because we're a transitional zone. We can grow soft neck and hard neck on the garlic, but garlic needs to be planted in the fall, even though you can buy it in the spring and plant it, and I know I've seen it for sale in the stores right now. You can go ahead and plant it. It's not going to form any size of a, of a good bulb, but you can grow it this spring, pull it up, separate it, and replant it this fall, and that way you can kind of start your garlic obsession. 
just to show you, this is a hardneck garlic a couple of years ago. Hardnecks form a flower down the center, and they're called a hardneck because they have a very, very hard stem down the center. And you can kind of see this one's going to have six or seven cloves there, but that center part is the hardneck. That's actually the flower stem. The hardnecks will form flowers. Most people break these off. So whenever they come up, they curl one time. You read a lot of books. Some people say leave them on. Some people say break them. I'm inclined to break them off because I think it provides more energy for the bulb. If the plant's focusing mostly on flowering, it's not going to be focusing on the size of the bulb. And if you do leave a few of these garlic flowers up, now I know I have friends who leave some up because the flowers are pretty in and of themselves. And they will form really small bulbs at the top, so you can take those and grow those on for more garlic. And if you have problems growing garlic, you probably shouldn't even be gardening to begin with. It's one of the most forgiving plants to grow in the garden. <laughs> when to pull up is a question I get asked a lot. After the bottom two or three leaves turn brown and the top five are still green, we want to pull it out when it has still green leaves because each leaf represents a shell around that garlic and we want four to five paper shells around that garlic because it helps out with storability. You need to hang it in a well-ventilated shady area, keep it out of the sun. I usually throw them over rafters in my barn. I've seen people hang it in their garage. I've seen people hang it on their porch out of the sun. It must cure anywhere from two to three, four weeks because it helps with storability. So you're going to hang it in bunches, excuse me. I thought I had a picture. You're going to hang it in bunches, and you're going to have 10 or 15 in a bunch tied up, and the leaves are still going to be green. That's when you hang it somewhere and just leave it alone. You don't actually cut it and use it until you cut through one to pull the bulb off to actually use, and it's completely brown inside. That means it's ready and it's cured. Curing helps out with storability. This is one that waited too long to be pulled up, so sometimes based upon the garden, and the rain, I'm not able to get out there and pull up as much as I want to. It needs to have four or five really good green leaves before I pull it up. This one, it, it didn't store really all that long. That's, that, that one's too far gone. So that's kind of looking what we look like. This is my wife, how we, we tie it up. We put 20 or 25 in bunches. I think that's too much. I think it needs to be a little bit lower, 10 to 15, because we had some in the center that just did not dry in time. We throw it over the rafters. You need to have some type of air circulation. And we were just using baling twine off of old hay. That was the garden a couple of years ago. I got caught in a storm. I came inside the barn just to show you uh, the rainbow there, little garlic patch. Looking at some of these different varieties, and like I said earlier, Tennessee is a transitional zone, so you can grow soft neck and hard neck. I don't think you could go wrong with any of them. There are great books out there on garlic growing, and I think if you're trying to find some good varieties of garlic to grow, any of these do well. And you may try out some of the, the more obscure varieties just to see if you like them because each garlic tastes different. Some are really mild in flavor, and some you need to, if you eat them hot, or if you eat them uh, raw with bruschetta or something like that, they're extremely hot. So kind of watch and, and do your own taste testing on some of these varieties. Here's some of the ones I've grown over the years. And I think my favorite is the one on the left. And it's, sometimes it's hard to find. It's purple glazer. It's a hard neck variety, good tasting bulb. And I grew a lot of it this year. Asian Tempest was one I, I'm growing also again this year. But I think purple glazer is still going to be my favorite one. Transylvanian red, northern white. Even though it had northern in the name, it still did fine in Tennessee. And Kellium red, purple glazer again, chestnut red. Go online. There are a lot of great garlic websites. So I know I mentioned earlier, when you're buying onions, you can find some companies that just specialize in onions. And they, they have shallots and leeks also. You can find some websites of good, reputable farms that sell great quality seed stock on garlic. Now be prepared. If it's a good quality garlic and you're trying to buy a pound, you're going to pay anywhere from $14 to $22, $25 a pound. But a pound of garlic can yield anywhere from 60 to 90 plants. So you're looking at 60 to 90 cloves on a pound of garlic. Uh, it could be less. It could be more. So just kind of 
you sometimes people will see sh sticker shock and like i just want a pound of seed you know 25 dollars, but you're going to get 60 or 70 plants out of that with all of these alliums leeks onions garlic shallots there are a few problems that can happen we see one i meant i should have mentioned this i should have typed this down but onion thrips can be a problem and mostly onion thrips eat the stems a little bit but really there's no there's nothing warranted unless they're really decimating it. And I, I've had a few in the past, but it's not enough to actually do anything about it because I want to, I want a larger bulb. I know the top needs to be healthy, but sometimes the damage to the top is not enough to actually warrant any type of us uh, to fix the problem. One other situation that I've had is onion maggots or wire worms. So I had, a, I've had bulbs, we'll say a, a garlic and they'll drill a hole in one clove and they'll eat it and they'll rot one side of the of the the bulb. It's really hard to treat insects that are below the soil. So sometimes people say, well, what can I spray? That that's really hard because it's below the ground. Ideally, for some things like that, the wireworm or the maggots, they overwinter in ground that's already had onions in it, it's already had uh, garlic in it, shallots or leeks. Turn your ground in the summer, in the excuse me, in the winter time, a couple of times if you can to flip those maggots over, those egg larvae over, and kill them on top of the ground in the winter time. Now that is hard when we get eight or nine inches of rain every month in the winter time, and winter is just a muddy, muddy mess. Now I understand that's hard. If you've got a smaller operation in the winter time, if you can, if you've had this situation in the past, flip over the garden as much as you can. It's harder on a larger garden. There are some rots that can be associated with onions and that can be associated with garlic. One that I can think of is called white rot where the bulb basically just kind of rots and deteriorates. We see that soil, it's a, it's a soil borne fungi. It needs to be planted somewhere else. So if you're having onions rot in the ground or garlic rot in the ground, that fungi is already in the soil. There's really not a lot that you can do for it in, in smaller type settings. I would just move it over a couple of feet if you can. If you've got a raised bed uh, and you've had problems in that one bed, you may want to move your onions to another raised bed and then put squash or, or turnip greens or something in there for a couple of years. But sometimes these soil borne fungi can last a couple of years. But if, uh, if you're having issues, buy healthy cloves. Sometimes if we're buying from unreputable places, we can transmit diseases from companies or we can transmit diseases from other people's gardens. So make sure you're buying from somebody you trust that, that they haven't had any issues and also buy from good reputable nurseries. Uh, that's my name and number and that's my email address. I'm the extension agent in Wilson County. I'm the horticulture extension agent. That's my office number, but I'll be honest, the easiest way to get a hold of me is email lholman1 at utk.edu. If you're not in Wilson County, I encourage you to go to your county extension agent. Go to utextension.tennessee.edu, and you can find out who your extension agent is, and you can email them any questions that you perhaps may have. So I'm going to hit stop recording for just a second. Stop share.